It doesn't seem hard. That is, until you have to do it. Then you realize it. Growth is hard. It takes hard work, focus, and dedication, none of which comes easy. Growth means stretching and expanding. It is painful. Things you outgrow will cling to you bitterly. You must pry them off of you and discard them. Everything in this world will fight your growth. Your flesh, your skeptical friends, your schedule, your doubts, gravity. Growth is hard. It requires you to redefine who you are and what you can do. Everyone around you will be uncomfortable with your growth. They would prefer you to stay the same. It makes them feel better about themselves. But growth is life. Anything you're not growing in, you are slowly shrinking in. So grow in the things that matter. Your faith, kindness, generosity, love, wisdom, humility, understanding. Because it's always time to grow up. Well, growing up on a farm as a kid, there are two things that stand out in my mind about that farm uh, more than anything else. How much I learned and how hard I worked. Because a farm is all about growing things, you know, plants and animals, which, of course, is a constant process of learning and working, right? When, when you plant a garden, it doesn't magically grow by itself after you put the seeds into the ground, does it? No, those, those plants require the right conditions, the right uh, soil, the right amount of sunlight, the right amount of water, the right amount of nutrients, right? And then, of course, there are the external threats to those plants that show up, weeds that might choke out those plants or steal their nutrients or wild animals that may try to consume or destroy those plants. But with enough understanding and hard work, tilling and weeding and watering and fertilizing and pruning and protecting, right? With enough understanding and enough hard work, the garden grows and it produces fruit. Well, animals are the same way. You have to provide the right environment, the right amount of food and water and shelter and sometimes protection in order for those animals to grow and thrive and ultimately to produce whatever they're raised to produce. Okay, growth always requires learning and hard work. There's no way around it, right? If you're, if you're going to grow in your career, you're going to have to continue to learn about that job or that industry or, or your customers, and then, of course, work really hard to continually get better at what you do so you can produce more at that job. If your relationship with your spouse, your marriage, if, if that's going to grow, then you're going to have to continue to learn about one another and work really hard to make that relationship better, stronger, deeper, right? If, if you have a skill or even a hobby that you love and you want to get better at that hobby or that skill, if you want to grow in that ability, you have to be willing to learn everything that you can about it and then work really hard to get better at it. In fact, uh, if you listen to a professional athlete or a professional musician or an artist talk about how they reach the level of skill to become a professional in their field, there are two things they'll almost always talk about how much they learned about that sport or that instrument or that craft and how hard they worked to become the very best that they could be, okay? Uh, growth at anything, doesn't matter what it is. Growth always requires learning and hard work because nothing grows by itself. And for, for the most part, I think we get that. What I'm not so sure we, we get as Christians is the fact that spiritual growth is exactly the same. It requires learning and hard work. There's no way around it because we don't know everything that there is to know about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's always more understanding and knowledge to be had when it comes to following Jesus than we can exhaust in a lifetime on this planet. Becoming a disciple, the man or the woman of God that he created us to become, that requires a lifetime of effort, a lifetime of work. In fact, at one point, uh, the Apostle Peter, who lived with Jesus himself for three years, he wrote to the church concerning some of the letters of Paul, the letters that Paul wrote about Jesus. 
right? The same Paul who never lived with Jesus. He, Peter wrote this about Paul's letters. He said, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. I just want to pause here for a second and, and we'll come back to the subject. But uh, just as a side note, you will often hear people talk about uh, the fact that when the New Testament writers were writing about Scripture and talking about Scripture, God breathing out Scripture and, and all of those references we have, that they were only talking about the Old Testament Scriptures because they didn't have the New Testament in their time. Well, that's not entirely true. In fact, it's not true at all. They didn't have the New Testament compiled the way that we have now. Right? And maybe some of those books weren't all completely written at the time. But the apostles, the, the New Testament writers, very clearly considered uh, the other apostles' writings to be Scripture on par with the Old Testament Scripture. And that's clear in this passage as well. Okay, So there are some things, he says, in them that are hard to understand in Paul's letters, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other Scriptures. So he's comparing Paul's letters to the other scriptures. And then he says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 16 through 18. Okay, if some of Paul's letters about Jesus are hard for Peter to understand, after being with Jesus personally in the flesh for three years, if Peter has more to learn about Christ through the scriptures, then I think it's safe to say that we have more to learn about Christ through the scriptures as well. And in fact, Peter commands that we continue to learn all that we can. He says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. OK, spiritual growth requires a constant commitment to learning and hard work. There's no way around it. We're not talking about salvation, you understand. We cannot earn our salvation. That's a free gift from God. We're talking about once you come to a saving knowledge and faith in Christ, becoming a disciple, that's a lifelong process after salvation. Okay, Spiritual growth requires a constant commitment to learning and to hard work. But listen, there's also an enemy of our spiritual growth. And it lurks about the church, worming its way into our lives until some stop actually producing spiritual fruit. It's what Paul described as joy, a peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. You see, uh, producing spiritual fruit in your life means living like Jesus lived. But listen, there's an enemy to that spiritual growth, and that enemy is complacency. Last week, we talked about casual Christianity uh, in chapter 4 of Hebrews, a Christianity that costs us nothing. And today, we'll be talking about complacent Christianity, a Christianity that produces nothing as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the letter to the Hebrews, where the author is confronting these Jewish Christians in the first century church who were facing persecution for following Jesus Christ rather than the religion of the Old Testament law. And as a result of that persecution and pressure from the religious culture they'd come out of, pressure to return to the fold, some of them were beginning to let the fire of the passion that they had for Christ to die out instead of contending for the faith, as Jude, the brother of Jesus, says we must do in Jude 1.3. They were becoming complacent about their faith and beginning to turn back to their old religion for answers to the pressure and persecution they were being confronted with rather than striving even harder after Christ, which is what the author of this letter is encouraging them to do, not to strive after religion, but to strive after a deeper relationship with Christ, to continue to learn more and more and to work harder and harder at deepening their relationship with him, because once you become complacent about that relationship, your spiritual growth stops. And when you stop growing spiritually, you stop producing spiritual fruit. And listen, uh, as far as Jesus was concerned, there was nothing worse than someone who claimed to be a follower of God and yet produced no spiritual fruit. 
in their lives. In chapter 11 of Mark's gospel, starting at verse 12, Mark says that one day, while Jesus was walking with his disciples from Bethany, he says he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat of fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Then verse 20 says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Now, just to be clear, Jesus wasn't mistaken about the timing of the fig season. He knew when figs would normally grow, but just as any other fruit-bearing plant can sometimes produce early or late from the regular growing season, this particular fig tree was in leaf. It means it was full of leaves. And listen, when fig trees are full of leaves, they're typically full of figs. And yet this particular fig tree was all talk and no action. Right? It, was, it was false advertising. It was full of fig leaves without any figs. And as far as Jesus was concerned, no matter how good the tree may have looked on the outside, no matter how healthy it may have appeared to be at its core, it was worthless. Why? Because it failed to do what it was put on this earth to do. You see, fig trees exist to produce figs, not just a bunch of leaves. And of course, it's an obvious metaphor for those who claim to be full of the Spirit of Christ, and yet nothing of Christ actually ever comes out of their lives. They produce no spiritual fruit. They're full of leaves. They profess to follow Christ. They regularly attend the church. They read their Bibles. They say the right things and maybe even participate in some of the activities of the ministry. But at the end of the day, all that they have is leaves. Every appearance of being a follower of Christ without any actual fruit. And, and it's not because they're incapable of producing fruit, by the way. No, the problem is they've become content with the leaves. They've become complacent because everything looks healthy. So why bother putting in all the work to actually produce the fruit? Well, here's why. And listen, this is the part that we really need to pay attention to. Jesus didn't curse the fig tree because it had no figs. No, there were fig trees all around him that had no figs. It wasn't fig season. Yet he wasn't going around cursing all of the other fig trees that had no figs. You understand, he cursed that particular fig tree because it was full of leaves. It was representing itself as a tree full of fruit when in fact it had none. And because of the false pretense, Jesus cursed the tree. And in doing so, he not only performs, by the way, the only destructive miracle of his uh, ministry on earth, but he was issuing a sober warning to all who would listen of just how serious of an offense it is to God for Christians to have the appearance of fruit without the fruit itself. And therein lies the focus of the author of Hebrews in this portion of the letter that we're covering today. As he very harshly, to be honest, warns the church not to be complacent about Christ. And I would say this is a message the church needs to hear today just as much as it did then. So let's turn there together to Hebrews chapter 4. We started that last week. We'll finish this chapter and see what we can learn about guarding against complacent Christianity. And then once we finish 4, we'll move through chapter 5 because it's very short. So we'll begin by reading Hebrews 4, verses 4 through 16. Excuse me, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So keeping in mind who the primary audience of this letter is, namely you know, Hebrew Christians, the author continues his discussion from chapters 2 and 3 about the fact that Jesus is the great high priest. 
And in this part of chapter 4, he really begins to explain the difference that fact can make in our daily lives. Because uh, in the Jerusalem temple, only the high priest could enter the most holy place. It was only once per year on the Day of Atonement as outlined in Leviticus 16 and uh, Hebrews 9, 7. So, so access to the presence of God was limited to one man once per year. But now, by offering himself once for all, Jesus, as the great high priest, has made a way for all believers to draw near to God. So unlike the days of old, the author says that God is now accessible to all believers. And yet he goes even beyond that because he not only invites us into his presence through Christ, but because of what Jesus did for us, the author says that Jesus actually feels what we feel. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The ancient Greek word sympatheo or sympathize as it is translated into the English in verse 15. It literally means to suffer along with. So Jesus feels what we feel. It's a concept that the Hebrew people really struggled with. In fact, uh, the ancient Jewish rabbis taught that God actually had two thrones, one for mercy and one for judgment, because although they knew that God was both merciful and just, they couldn't reconcile those two attributes of God in the same person. So they believed that God must have actually had two different thrones in order to be able to display such different opposing aspects, as they saw it, of his character. And the Gentiles, uh, by the way, weren't any better. To the ancient Greeks, the primary attribute of God was summed up in the Greek word apatheia, which was uh, the essential inability to feel anything at all. So along comes this letter, which turns all of these notions about God being unfeeling and unavailable completely upside down, as the author points out that through the finished work of Jesus, we can see the mercy and the judgment of God reconciled into one throne of grace. And the most amazing part of that is he says that we can now with confidence draw near to that throne of grace in order to receive the mercy and grace and help that we need in our greatest times of need. Now, just put yourself in the shoes of these first century Christians who had become complacent about a God who they were raised to believe was largely unable to sympathize with them and largely inaccessible to them, a God who would extend grace to the average Hebrew via the offerings of the high priest once a year. But here they are reading a letter that says grace comes through drawing near to Christ personally. Yourself, without waiting on an intermediary to do it for you once a year. Oh, and by the way, you can not only draw near to God yourself now, but you can do it with confidence. You have to understand this was a completely foreign concept to the average Hebrew mind. The idea that anyone who puts their faith in Christ now has unfettered access to the same God who only Moses or Joshua or Aaron or the other high priests previously had access to. This was a paradigm shattering concept for these first century Hebrews who were being completely challenged by the author of this letter to confront their own complacency about God by drawing near to Christ because you cannot be complacent about someone you're actively pursuing. You can't. You cannot be complacent about someone you're actively pursuing. The problem with most people in Western society today is that we're more committed to pursuing ourselves than we are anyone else, including God. In our society, self has become our God, and that prevailing attitude has even infiltrated the church where pleasing people has often become more of a priority than glorifying God. Perhaps the embodiment of this sad and very twisted yet very popular way of thinking in our culture is summed up in a quote by American actress and author Shirley MacLaine, who once said, the only sustaining love involvement is with yourself. When you look back on your life and try to figure out where you've been and where you're going, when you look at your work 
your love affairs, your marriages, your children, your pain, your happiness. When you examine all that closely, what you really find out is that the only person you really go to bed with is yourself. She also said, I don't need anyone to rectify my existence. The most profound relationship we will ever have is the one with ourselves. God help us. <laughs> if the most profound relationship that we ever have is with ourselves, then we are all in a lot of trouble. No, the most profound relationship that you could ever hope to have is actually the one that is available to every single one of us. It's a relationship with the one who is in the beginning with God, John 1, 2. The Word who was with God and the Word who was God, John 1, 1. This one through whom all things, his Word says, were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1.16, he's the one through whom all things hold together. Colossians 1.17, the one through whom all of us exist. 1 Corinthians 8.6, he's the one who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty, Revelation 1.8, he's the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The beginning and the end, Revelation 22, 13. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Revelation 17, 14. The founder and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. He's the Good Shepherd, John 10, 11. The Bread of Life, John 6, 35. The Judge of the Living and the Dead, Acts 10, 42. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world, John 1, 29. He's the light of the world, John 8, 12. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5, 5. Your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob, Isaiah 60, 16. He's the one who sets you free, John 8, 36. He is our hope, 1 Timothy 1, 1. He is our peace, Ephesians 2, 14. He is our redeemer, Job 19.25, He is our Savior. Luke 10.11, He is the resurrection and the life. John 11.25, He is in fact the one who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is His name. Amos 4.13, we know Him as Jesus Christ. Maybe it's just me. I just think that is a far more profound relationship to have than the one I have with myself. Okay? If you want to have a truly profound relationship in your life, actually a relationship that will change the way you see yourself, change the way you see your purpose, change the way you see other people, change the way you make decisions, Change the way you approach each new day. And in fact, it will change the way that you appreciate every breath and every moment that you've been given. If you want a relationship that will completely obliterate your complacency and set your life on an entirely new trajectory, then take your focus off of yourself and draw near to Jesus Christ and He in turn will draw near to you. It's one of the keys to killing complacency in your life, taking the focus off of yourself and drawing near to Jesus, okay? The reason we become complacent about God is because we're more focused on our personal needs than we are in a relationship with Him. And yet all the while, what we're missing is the fact that our greatest personal need is a relationship with Him. So look, if you've become complacent about God, if you stop growing spiritually, right? if you've stopped producing spiritual fruit in your life, if you will simply draw near to Christ, I'm telling you before long, you will see new growth begin to happen in your life and not just leaves, but real fruit, a new interest in him and in his plan for your life, a new interest in other people and in his plan for their lives. And out of that, spiritual fruit, real fruit, 
spiritual fruit will come. But make no mistake, that takes hard learning and hard work. Let's keep reading. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So after describing the role of the high priest, the author uses an ancient rabbinic technique called verbal uh, analogy. It's where the teacher of a lesson would Uh, sort of string together a series of scripture references from different parts of scripture to support their thesis or the argument that they were making. And so in this case, he couples two different psalms together by partially quoting Psalm 2-7 and Psalm 110-4 in verses 5 and 6 of the letter here, firmly establishing that Jesus Christ is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we won't get into Melchizedek today, other than to say that like Jesus, he was both a priest and a king because uh, chapter 7 is all about Jesus Christ in relationship to the priesthood of Melchizedek. So we're going to, uh, we're going to go into all of that in great depth when we get to chapter 7. For now, uh, we'll turn our focus on to verses 7 through 10 where the author, after making his case for our need to draw near uh, to Christ at the end of chapter 4, now focuses on our motivation for doing that. In other words, why? Why should we want to draw near to Christ? And the the answer may not be what you expect, okay? You'll find that Christians have all sorts of motivations for pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ, and although many of those may have some merit, There's really only one reason for pursuing him that is primary to God himself. And that reason is simple obedience. Speaking of Jesus, the author says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So Jesus is the source of salvation to all who obey him. You see, we must learn to be obedient, just as Jesus learned to be obedient. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But first, how did Jesus learn that obedience? Well, it was through suffering. And likewise for us, obedience comes through suffering for Christ. And listen, guys, this is the point where we we need to pause and get really honest with ourselves about obedience. Why are we moved to draw near to Christ? What is our true motivation that drives us to pursue Him? Because honestly, if we're not careful, our motivation for pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ will be based on the value system of this world rather than on the command of God, which I happen to believe is actually the case for many, many Christians today. In fact, fact, I would say that the modern church is guilty of selling people on a relationship with Jesus Christ based on the world's value system rather than on God's will. Here's what I mean. Is your primary motivation for drawing near to Jesus Christ based on a blessing that you may get out of it? Now listen, there's untold blessing to be had when we draw near to Christ without question. But is that your primary motivation for doing so or is it simple obedience to his call to do so? Is your primary motivation for drawing near to Christ uh, shelter from some kind of storm in your life, something 
difficult maybe that you're dealing with. And listen, without question, we find shelter in the shadow of the Almighty, 91.1. But the question is, is that your primary motivation for drawing near to Him? Or is it simple obedience to His call to draw near to Him? Is your primary motivation for drawing near to Christ the feeling you get when you're close to Him? And I'll just tell you, there is no other feeling in this world like it. But is that your primary motivation for drawing near to Christ? Or is it simple obedience to the fact that He has called you to draw near to Him? Please understand, this is profoundly important that we figure this out in our own lives. Because investing in something primarily in order to get something back out of it that we want is a facet of the value system of this world, not of God. The reason that's a problem for the body of Christ today is because when our motivation for drawing near to Him is based on getting something back that we want from Him, then our value system is undermined when we draw near to Him and don't get back what we want. It's exactly what happens to Christians every single day who often then become complacent about their relationship with Christ when we draw near to Him and we pray for something we want and then we don't get it. What do we do then? Well, if your value system is based on the world's value system, then God has just undermined your values because He hasn't held up His end of the bargain. So what happens then? But well, what happens is we become complacent and eventually we'll walk away from God just like these Hebrew Christians were doing. And we say things like, yeah, you know, I tried Jesus once, but it didn't work out for me. No, actually what you did was you tried Jesus on your own terms rather than on his terms. You pursued him based on the world's value system rather than on God's value system, which will leave you disillusioned with God Every single time, because as we all know, we don't always get what we want from God. Bible scholar George Guthrie wrote, Danger lies in embracing the world's value system, for she is a mother who often eats her young. Listen, Jesus had to confront this very temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane. The author references it. In verse 7 that we just read, it also makes chapter 4, verse 15, all that much more potent. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Because when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing he was about to suffer the most horrific death on a cross, Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. You see, in that moment, as Jesus was drawing near to the Father, He wasn't feeling peaceful about His circumstances. He wasn't looking forward to what He was about to receive on a Roman cross. No, in that moment, the only thing Jesus was feeling was agony and turmoil and deep inner struggle. Clearly, it wasn't warm emotions or joyful anticipation or a feeling of safety and security that drove Jesus to the Father. No, in that moment, it was sheer and sober obedience. British author and scholar H.A. Hodges wrote, By our steady adherence to God when the affections, i.e. emotions, are dried up, and nothing is left but the naked will clinging blindly to Him, the soul is purged of self-regard and trained in pure love. Okay, the, the problem with so much of the church today is that we've allowed ourselves to be motivated to pursue Christ based on values that we've co-opted from this world. 
We all want the Garden of Eden without the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet that, that reality doesn't exist in God's value system where obedience, he says, comes through suffering. Which means in order to reach the depth of obedience that God is calling you to, you must be willing to follow him no matter the cost to you personally, which will mean a lot of hard learning at the very least and a lot of hard work. Which leads us to one more point that I want to make about Jesus and obedience before we read the rest of the chapter. When the author says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, he's not saying that before his suffering, Jesus was disobedient. This is another misunderstanding that is common in the church today, the idea that obedience is a destination rather than a journey. And listen, you can be perfectly obedient to God as Jesus was and still not uh, and still learn to be obedient in ways that you never were before. Because it's not always a matter of going from disobedience to obedience. Rather, often as Christians, we must move from obedience to a deeper level of obedience. Okay, you can be perfectly obedient to God's will today, and yet tomorrow he calls you to a whole new level of obedience, a deeper level of obedience, because it's a journey, not a destination. Again, Guthrie says, Jesus' call involved walking obediently all the way to the end of a path to which the Father had appointed him. And it's the very same for us, except we can't see the end of the path. In fact, often we can't even see the next step on the path, which is why obedience is so critical in our journey of following Christ. We must be willing to follow him even when that means suffering for his sake, being willing to go wherever he calls you to go, no matter the cost to you personally, which is the only way you will ever truly walk the entire path that he's called you to walk in this lifetime. Let's finish the chapter then, verse 11 to the end. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So uh, the author starts out with the importance of drawing near to Christ. And then he talks about our motivation for doing that, which should be obedience above all else. And then he finishes the chapter here by talking about the spiritual fruit that drawing near to Christ through obedience should produce in our lives, namely uh, a church full of mature Christians. But the problem for the author and for the church today, and for that matter, the church in every age, is that we have often become dull of hearing. We're so used to being preached to and led in worship and prayed for and cared for and reassured by the church. And listen, that's the way it should be. That's all good. However, we can become so used to all of that one-way spiritual input into our lives that we become dull of hearing it. We become so used to it all that it loses its force in our lives. And before long, we've become complacent about the word of Christ in our lives. It's just, it's just what the author was confronting here. So he says, look, you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. He's talking about the basic concepts of the word of God. He says you need milk not solid food. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. You see what he's saying here? It's time to grow up. It's time for you to mature. And yet the spiritual maturity you need doesn't simply come by hearing the word of Christ. No, maturity comes through practicing the word of Christ, constant practice, he says, hard learning and hard work. 
So it's great to come to church and receive. You should do that. But if that is all that you ever do, then your life will be full of leaves without any fruit. Because you must do more than just receive. You must put what you receive into practice. Constant practice, in fact, for that is how you mature and ultimately produce spiritual fruit in your lives. And by the way, uh, this wasn't spoken by the author out of anger or arrogance. He wasn't looking down his perfect nose at these uh, broken people. No, this was a heartfelt pleading from a preacher based on a desperate love for God's people. And we see it throughout the scriptures from the prophets to the apostles to the pastors throughout God's word. The admonition to do more than just receive the word of God, but to practice the word of God. James, the brother of Jesus, put it this way. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. In other words, he becomes dull of hearing. Right? But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, the one who puts in the time, the effort, the hard learning, and the hard work, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing, James 1, through 25. Okay, we, we come here at least once a week to worship together, to serve one another together, to fellowship together and to learn together. And all of that is vital to our personal growth and vital to the health of the body of Christ. It's all good, but your call, listen, your call goes beyond these walls, which means the next question is, what are you doing outside of these walls together to put into practice, constant practice, what you're learning together within these walls? Because I'm telling you, Nothing will kill complacency faster in your life than putting God's word into practice in your life. The Apostle Paul wrote, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are what? Zealous for good works. Titus 2, 11 through 14. Are you zealous for good works? Do you find yourself excited by opportunities to put God's word into practice? Does the possibility of exercising his word in your life when you meet someone new or learn something new in the word, does that inspire you to action? Or have you become dull of the hearing of it, complacent about your faith and what you've learned, always receiving but never giving? If so, let me just encourage you today. It's time to grow up. It's time to take that next step in your journey. It's time to get off the bench and into the game. It's time to put into practice what you've learned. It's time to produce more than just leaves that make you healthy. It's time to produce mature spiritual fruit, which proves that you are healthy. We'll be talking about this more next week, but you understand when a tree produces fruit, it's not the tree that consumes that fruit. No, the fruit is for those around that tree who need its fruit to survive. We don't produce spiritual fruit to make us healthy. We produce spiritual fruit because we are healthy, which means others can feed on that fruit and in turn grow and become healthy themselves. You see... Your spiritual maturity is not just about your health. It's about others who need you desperately to be healthy so they can be healthy too, which means on the flip side, your complacency isn't just hurting you. 
It's also denying others the nourishment that they need from you. What does all that mean? It means it's time to grow up. It's time to stop focusing on yourself. It's time to start obeying God's word when you feel like it. And guess what? When you don't feel like it. And it's time to begin producing real spiritual fruit in your life by putting what you've learned into constant practice. Listen, I don't want to be a tree full of leaves but no fruit. Yet that is exactly what complacent Christianity has produced in the lives of scores of Christians. In fact, I fear that the American church today is rife with complacent Christianity. Men and women who have heard the word over and over and over and over and over again. But we've become so dull of hearing that our lives look spiritually healthy. We're full of beautiful leaves. And yet all around us, people are starving to death because there's no fruit for them to eat. God hasn't planted us here for decoration. To look good on the landscape. No, he's planted us here to feed the world with his truth and his grace. And of course, we know there will always be some who refuse to eat. But listen, let's not allow one human soul around us who is hungry to starve to death because in our complacency, we have no fruit to offer them. No, I, I say together, I say we kill complacency in our lives by drawing near to Jesus Christ in obedience to that call, no matter the cost to us personally, no matter how much hard learning and hard work it takes. And then together, let us put into practice what we've learned that no one, that no one would ever fall victim to a church that is complacent ever again. Let's pray.